Hi, it's Tony from CassetteComeback.com and today I'm going to do you a video about Type 1 cassettes. You know, Type 1 cassettes, the most common, the cheapest, the ones that are only fit for voice, the ones that I personally throw in the trash because I don't do anything less than a Type 2 and a Type 4. Or so some high rollers in the old forums and Facebook groups would say. This video is to dispel them, miss. This video isn't for those guys. You know, you keep buying your Type 2s and your Type 4s and saying all Type 1 are trash. Fair enough. I'm not trying to convince you here. But this is more for the new guys and gals who are joining the hobby. And I want to let you know that Type 1s get a bad rap. I mean, fair enough. This type of Type 1 deserves all of the wrath it gets. Because this basically is what I would class as a Type 0. You've probably seen them in many different guises, many different colours. They, you know, the, the kitsch, you know, some people actually collect these. But in reality, they're the lowest of the low. I mean, they always usually have a very cheap looking shell, a tacky plastic, nasty paper label. And the tape itself is, you know, kind of dull, not very brown, almost sandpaper-ish. Yeah, these are not good tapes. And these are probably the tapes that the high rollers who say all type 1 are junk probably used back in the 70s in their boom box or their shoe box cassette player. It made a bad recording and they never returned. But that's unfair. Do not dismiss all type 1 tapes. Because over time, they got better than these. In fact, over time, they created some of the best tapes ever. Because yes, at the time, some reviewers believed that the best type ones are among the best tapes ever made. But I think there's maybe four different types of type one tape. I mean, if we look at these ones, okay, you all recognise this one. Who doesn't recognise the TDKD? This is probably the workhorse cassette. It's the one that was always commonly available, easy to find, made great recordings, was uh, very reasonably priced, and they lasted. The TDKD is a great cassette. It is very musical. If the hiss bothers you, and I say if the hiss bothers you, why are you really using cassettes again? Because seriously, the quest to get the hiss out of a cassette by DBX or Dolby S or defeats the object. Listen to your flag files if that's what you really want. Hiss to me reminds me it's a cassette. And that inherent hiss is part of the nostalgia, which makes me love cassettes. But the thing I like about a lot of tight ones is simply because of the very nature of the ferric oxide particles. You take a very digital and crystalline source, you know, something that's never been on analog, something that was done on a laptop, recorded in the digital realm, and has always been digital, put it on a ferric, maybe even a dirty ferric. And what do I mean by dirty ferric? I mean one that does actually colour the sound. But it gives it analog warmth. It takes that digital edge away. And that little hiss is part of the charm as far as I'm concerned. So I don't try and kill it. And therefore, it takes like the D, the HF, and the UR are the workhorses that make this hobby what it is and make cassettes the joy they are. The nostalgia, the looks, the value for money. These are proper cassettes. They're not trying to do an exact copy of a digital source. They're analogue and they sound analogue and they can warm up a cold digital source. But there's more than just these type. That's the second type. The other type of ferrics are these type. Now, I wouldn't class these as super ferrets because there is a lot of banding about super ferric, what makes a super ferric and what doesn't. Um, these have smaller particles and, you know, the HF has a particle side, but the HFS has a slightly smaller particle size. It has a bit less hiss. It can take more level. I don't know if they're cobalt doped or not. Usually you can tell because the tape isn't brown, it's more black. But then some of the other tapes I'm going to show you really don't have black tape. But they are super ferrics. So we've got the HFS. We've got the likes of the UDI, which again, look at the shell. It's the same shell as the UD2 and almost the same shell as the XL2 of the same type, but a great Type 1 tape that can take a lot of level. And then this one. Who's ever heard anything bad said against a TDKAD? Very reliable, very musical, can take a lot of level, but again, 
it's just a mere tight one and I think those words there are part of the problem with the sort of what people think of tight ones the part of the image problem is that it says normal and why would you want normal when you can have high no one wants to be thought of being normal so these cassettes say normal and that's been part of the perception problem but then we go on to the likes of these the Maxell XLIS you read about this some people will say this is one of the best cassettes ever made and I believe them if you look Epitaxial cassette now let's go into this and let's just understand it. When I did my video on Chrome, I said that a lot of the Type 2 tapes which are out there are not Chrome. Chrome Position maybe, Chrome Class maybe, but they don't contain Chrome Pigment. It's whereas Chrome became the common nomenclature for a Type 2 tape. You know, just like everyone calls vacuum cleaners Hoovers. And so Chrome became known as being a Type 2 tape, even though a lot of them did not contain Chrome. This is the case here. This cassette is a cobalt dope ferric epitaxial. This is what Maxell used for their Type 2 cassettes, epitaxial. The Type 2 XL2 and XL2S are cobalt dope ferric. This is also a cobalt dope ferric, but only if you look at the top. This is for 120 US EQ, whereas the Type 2 are for 70 US EQ, but essentially they are both cobalt dope ferric. And yet the high rollers love the Type 2s and hate the Type 1s. But it's got the same tape in it. Again, the TDK ARX, commonly regarded as one of the best tapes ever. It says on it, extra high mol, high output. The mol on this is tremendous. The amount of level this tape can take is tremendous. It takes metal levels of input. It's just fantastic. And then we've got this one, which to me is one of the greatest tapes ever made. The FR1 Super. It will match the ARX in my book. Superb amount of level, superb clarity. But the thing with the Ferrix is that you've got all the bass there, whereas a metal can be a bit crispy and a bit la lacking in the base department. The Cobalt Dolt Super Ferrix like this have got the top end, but they've also got the base. And then just to be different, as they always are, we've got Tayo Uden back with the That's brand. And this one, as far as I can tell, is actually metal tape for 120 US EQ, i.e. it's a Type 1 tape, but... It's got Type 4 tape in it. And this is an insane cassette. Very rare, very expensive, but insane. Because from what I can tell, Tayo Yudin didn't do like most other tape companies. Start with a ferric, then do cobalt dope it to make a Type 2, and then decide if they want metal. They started off making metal tapes, and then made metal tapes for Type 2, and in this case, Type 1. So like I've been saying, do not dismiss type 1 tapes and do not think that they're all the same as these things because they're not there's a wide variety all with different sound and all with different uses so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take a few of these and we're going to do some recording on them and you can hear for yourself how good type 1 tapes really can sound so the deck I'm going to use for this is my Denon DRM44HX the reason I'm using this deck is for three reasons. One, that it's a three-head deck, so it means we can listen to the source, but we can also listen to the tape as it's being recorded. Two, it's got Dolby HX Pro, which does help with the top end on ferric tapes. And three, it's got an auto-tuning facility, which means I don't have to go around messing with the bias and the levels. It'll calibrate the tape for me automatically. So the first tape we're going to use is going to be this Type 0. I'm not holding out much hope. But let's see what the deck does with this. Let's see if it can auto-tune it at all to begin with. What it does now is it plays some test tones and then it makes the bias higher or lower and the level higher or lower depending. Oh, it's, it says memory, so it's actually recorded something on it. So I'm going to keep this as a constant four and a half just so that we can have a level playing field for all the tapes, except maybe later where I'll crank it up. But right now, let's just listen to the source and let's see 
how this performs. So it's recording, here's the source. You can see it's peaking at plus one. Let's have a see what this is recording at. As you can see here on this type zero, it's about six dB down on the actual source. Here we're recording around minus five. The actual deck is recording around one to three. But just out of fun, let's crank the level up until it matches and see if this can make any sort of decent sounding recording. I don't know about you, but I'm hearing distortion here. Mm. Yeah, so there's a massive difference there, and there's a reason why these tapes are called Type Zero and aren't loved. They are pretty rubbish. So let's get that out and hope that it hasn't ground down the heads of my deck and let's try something much much better but yet price wise not that much more expensive i've got here a classic 1986 sony hf i think we all use these at one point wonderful cassette lovely shell a real iconic classic this should calibrate up no problem i hope there we go all calibrated up right Let's have a listen. Let's play some music through it. As we can see, because this is on the tape, the level's there, peaking at one, one to three. It's compared to the source. There we go. So listen to the source for a bit. Another tape. Turn down just a little bit, take it down to about one, put some Dolby on it. As you can hear, especially with a bit of Dolby, you can make very fine recordings on a decent, normal, everyday type one. Even without type, uh, without Dolby, not making a bad noise now, is it? Not a lot of hiss. Good. Right. Let us now try something a little bit better. Let's go to the classic AD. Love these tapes. I mean, look at that shell. That shell just says Teutonic well-made goodness. And like I say, I've never heard a bad thing said against an AD. It shouldn't take a second to auto cal. Let's get it back to four and a half as it was. Let's do some recording. Let's crank this a bit now. Let's take this up. It's a bit too much. I don't want to distort the recording, so leave it there, peaking at five. In mind, there's no Dolby on this. It's the source. Whoa. 
the repeats on this. But as you can hear there, that sounded very good. For a lowly type one, that was taking, well, I thought levels I'd run a metal at. And speaking of which, let's go to this, the FR1 Super, which I absolutely adore this cassette. See what we can do here. Okay, all calibrated up. Let's put this down to four and a half again input. To begin with, let's play some music. I say it's matching the input perfectly, that's the source. That's the tape. Okay, let's crank this a bit. No noise reduction. This is what a lowly tight one sounds like. Mm. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. So there we go, tight ones. Only fit for voice of the trash, are they? Yeah, try a good one in a good deck. See if you can change your mind. Sounded good, didn't they? All of them, even the HF. It all depends on how good your equipment is, what source you're using as well. You know, if you're going to be using something with a lot of bass, like dance, etc., tight one's great because it gets that bass. The super, like these guys, also get the treble as well. And HX Pro does help because headroom extension, it adds more to the top. However, I've got to mention something which I'm sure a lot of you out there are like chomping at the bit to say, and that's this. You see, in the day, tapes like these sometimes cost more than a Type 2. And most people, let's be honest, what are you going to buy? Are you going to buy a normal tape? Or for less, can you have a high tape? And that's the point. People bought the high tape. And I'm going to be honest with you, so did I. I never bought Super Ferrix in the day. I thought Ferrix were cheap, the bottom of the range. You want as much or even more for a Type 1 than I can get a Type 2 for less? Are you crazy? Why would I do that? And because of this, not many of these were sold. And because not many were sold, there's not lots out there at the moment. For example, things like this, you'll be lucky to see cheaper than a metal. And certainly they're more expensive than an SA or an SAX, depending on the vintage. So these now really, whew, there's not a lot of point of buying them unless you actually want to try them out. But this video wasn't about trying to convert people. It's just to simply say, if you're new to the hobby and everyone says that Type 1 are universally rubbish and just for voice and just for the bin, this is to say, not all of them are. In fact, most Type 1 tapes are perfectly musical and the best Type 1 tapes are absolutely superb. It all depends on what you want to spend and what equipment you're recording them on. So, I'll leave you with this. If you, you know, have got the anchoring after this video to try some of these top of the range type ones out or even just to say you know what that hf sounded pretty good to me that'll do for my generic recordings or recordings i'm going to give to other people then do get some and don't forget cassettecomeback.com has all of these in stock well apart from this one i've sold out of this one that's uh, something that i keep myself because they're just fantastic but we've got the best deals on all of these different ferric tapes all these super tight ones. So do come across and see it at cassettecomeback.com. But other than that, thanks for watching 
And like I say, next time you see someone saying tight one is in the trash, don't stick up for the tight one because they are some of the best, most hardy and most faithful cassettes ever made. Thanks a lot.